Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Cardiovascular Themes UCLA CTSI Distinguished uh, Seminar Series. Uh, we have uh, people in person here, and a lot of people are also signed in to Zoom. So uh, hopefully everybody will enjoy this uh, seminar. So just a brief background about the topic and our speaker. So uh, if people remember, on December 3rd, 1967, a South African surgeon by the name of Christian Barnard performed the first human heart transplant for where a heart from an accident victim was transplanted into a 54-year-old uh, male. And over the next 18 days, the concept of the success of heart transplantation was proved. We've come a long way since then where cardiac transplantation is uh, uh, provided in major tertiary medical centers. But there's a fundamental problem which has remained, which is the, don which is the shortage of donor organs. Our speaker, Dr. Griffith, works in the field of xenotransplantation, which fundamentally addresses this problem by, by providing do, uh, donor hearts from non-human species, which can be transplanted into uh, uh, human heart, uh, human chest. Um, the concept of xenotransplantation is not a new idea. The medical reports go back to early 1900s, for example, where failing kidneys and humans were often tried to be substituted by animal uh, kidneys from rabbits and so on. But it's only in the uh, late 80s, 90s, and 2000s that a fundamental revolution in immunology, rejection biology has taken place that has enabled uh, xenotransplantation to be a medical possibility. Our speaker today, Dr. Griffith, is really a pioneer in the field of xenotransplantation. He holds the Thomas E. and Alice Mary Hales Distinguished Professor at the University of Maryland and is a clinical director also of their xenotransplant program. Throughout Dr. Griffith's career, he's really stayed at the forefront of finding alternative strategies for end-stage heart failure, including artificial heart, assist devices, ECMO, and in his CV, I was reading yesterday about his early work on the artificial lung. He is a graduate of Jefferson Medical College, completed a surgical training at the University of Pittsburgh, where he remained uh, for much of his career, and then went to the University of Maryland, where he is um, currently holds a distinguished chair today. On January 7, 2022, uh, almost exactly 55 years after Christian Bernard performed the first heart transplant, Dr. Griffith and colleagues performed the first modern Xeno heart transplant from a genetically modified pig to a terminally ill individual, and they followed it up with the second cardiac Xeno transplant in September of last year. As you can imagine, this has created an immense degree of excitement in the clinical and scientific community and Dr. Griffith is one of the most sought after speakers in the cardiovascular and transplantation community today. So we're very grateful that he's here at UCLA today. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Bartley Griffith, who I call the Christian Barnard <laughs> of Zeno Transplantation. Thanks, you, know, you can keep talking. I don't have to speak that much. Thanks a lot. So it's, a, it's great to be here. UCLA is, you know, a long way from Baltimore this morning. And, uh, and we think of it being sunny. It's actually a nicer day in Baltimore than it is here in LA, as you, you might suggest. Of course, it'll be snow when I go back. So uh, trying to get a good day out of this. Um, you got the clicker? Great. So it's been a little bit of a whirlwind a uh, few years. Uh, never have two patients now created... Um, as much angst, if you wish, in the investigators as, as I can imagine, right? So I think about those days uh, a long time ago when Bernard really did electrify uh, the world. Me as a, as a um, uh, graduate of, of high school by one year, you know, just riveted. Uh, it was really quite cool. I had the great opportunity 20 years after that to be on Good Morning America, believe it or not, took the red eye, was at a meeting here, and took the red eye to meet Rob Jarvik and um, Christian Bernard for the 20th anniversary. And at the time, I was involved in a program at Pittsburgh and a lot of transplants being done. So they needed a current transplanter. So they found me, 
but they put me in the middle between those two bookends. Um, and if you if you know anything about uh, uh, Bernard, you know he was loquacious and you know quite the person to talk to. And um, so said for uh, Rob Jarvik, who uh, you know brought the total artificial heart to clinical use. So those two cats were going back and forth, and I just looked like a guy refereeing a tennis match. Um, but it was fun. We pulled those uh, those those videos out, and in the middle of that conversation, Bernard starts talking about human animal transplants. And so you never know, maybe maybe that little thing that happened to me got a little germination seed back then, but it was really neat to be with those two people and you just never know. So keep your eyes and ears open as you wander through your, um, your careers. So on the right-hand side is the second patient that we transplanted. He was sick. We tried to get him done before he got as sick as our first patient because I don't think there would be a surgeon alive that would have transplanted uh, our first patient and maybe even this one in their state at the time of transplantation. They both failed to qualify for standard transplantation. I'll be glad to um, answer those questions and the ethics of all that uh, in a question and answer period if you would like. But preoperatively, this, this gentleman had had a cardiac arrest. In fact, the dean of the medical school was in to see him. All the potentates come in early. You know, They all you know, want to take credit for paying for this. And, that talked to their board of trustees, how they met the patient and this and that. He walked into the room and this patient had a cardiac arrest. He went VTAC, V-fibs, needed a full CPR to get going. Luckily, he did have an AICD in place, so he basically auto-defibrillated. So we got him into the operating room pretty soon thereafter. And the first post-operative picture, patient, pig's heart, no longer with pulmonary edema. Now, I cheated a little bit here because he had bilateral pleural fusions and I drained him. So the lungs look a little better than maybe that pump function alone, but it was a dramatic change. And I show it today to suggest to you that the pig heart works just fine, okay? Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about the anatomy, which is very different in the pig heart in terms of the structure, the, the ultra uh, structure, you know, the way it is built, there's more collagen in it, it's a thicker thing, there's, there's um, less compliance, but it's a pretty good substitute. And I think going forward, we can put the concern about the pig heart being a bad choice um, to bed. So this is a very serious commercial enterprise to be. Uh, I'm working as a, uh, basically uh, a contractor with a great big, more than $24 million grant to do what I've been doing for the last five years and that's peanuts compared to what is being spent on this enterprise by United Therapeutics. United Therapeutics run by Martine Rothblatt. She invented Cirrus Radio, had a, had a daughter named Destiny who was born with primary pulmonary hypertension. Her mom realized there wasn't much medicine out there for that, so she sold Cirrus and then started up a drug company to create drugs that her daughter could take that would address her pulmonary hypertension. All the oral drugs for pulmonary hypertension last 15 years have come from United Therapeutics. And it's been a marvelous thing for so many patients. She wasn't sure she backed it up. She wanted to have an organ on demand. And so she started this whole interest using the lung as the fulcrum around which uh, xenotransplantation had a life. So what we're looking at now on the right-hand side is the new facility. It's called a, um, a D. Uh, DPF, it's a designated pathogen-free facility because when you're growing pigs, they're not the cleanest of animals, right? They get a lot of viruses and they commingle and uh, they're rubbing up with each other. So you've got to keep them clean. So the herd has to be clean of viruses. And that actually um, is something we're going to address in our first patient as I go through that. But this, this clean facility is like $80 million. It's like a whole new hospital wing for you guys, right? Although you, you build billion dollar hospitals, right? Okay. Well, that seems, you know, for an East Coaster, that seems like a lot of money to spend, right? On, on an exercise. And the two main groups that are working on the Xeno organ to human transplant is a group at Johns Hopkins by way of uh, Kaz Yamada here. And he's in the front of the airplane with his fellow and I'm in the back of this airplane, and we just picked up um, with uh, we just picked up a heart and a kidney from the Virginia depot, if you wish. We harvested the the animal stuff there, and we put them on the rigs. And now we're taking it back to Baltimore to do the various transplants. We did the heart, and uh, he did the kidney. So it's kind of neat, and it's nice to 
to work with uh, with Kaz. He's been in, into this for almost uh, uh, 20 years, working on tolerance. And uh, my partner in all this, uh, Dr. Moedine, has been likewise involved in a long time in Zeno heart transplantation. So it's not a fly-by-night uh, group in terms of experience. What about the pig? You know, pig can be commercialized. You can, you can grow a pig to full size in about eight months. Um, you have big litters. Uh, they're relatively easy to manage, and uh, we know how to clone them. Um, so let's just look at that. So if we just took a wild type pig and put that pig's heart in the abdomen of a baboon, so a non-human primate, right, to test whether or not we had the right immune suppression and all this stuff. It's like we do that in rats all the time. We do intra-abdominal uh, placement of rat hearts. And we do all kinds of manners of tests. You can do 10 of those in a day kind of thing. And you palpate the abdomen to see if it's working. Um, so that had been, before Dr. Moedine moved to Maryland, that had been his method at the NIH. He didn't have to put the animal on bypass. He could just plug it in almost like a kidney into the arterial system in the, in the abdomen. It was a non-working heart. Nonetheless, it was perfused and was subject to the immunology of the patient, which in that case was a baboon. So if you take a wild heart, a wild type heart, and you, you, you sew it into a baboon, how long do you think that thing works? Couple of days, what? Huh? Minutes. It infarcts before your very eyes. And it does so because your body says, I just got a bee sting and I'm allergic to it. Right? So you start to thrombose and start to leak from your blood vessels. But those are basically small vessel uh, thromboses of the coronary arteries. So that's a massive myocardial infarction. Okay, so that won't work. So then we've got to change genes. How many genes does a pig have? I'm going to go after the back row on that. Okay, I told you I was going to ask you a question. But how many genes does a pig have? More than 10. Okay. That's why you're in the back row. All right, somebody in the front row. Um, anybody want to, want to venture? Obviously more than 10. How many? 50,000. Very good guess. It's 30,000. 30,000 genes. So I would define surgical hubris as saying, we're going to change 10 of them, and then we're going to assume it's going to not reject, right? Well, that's exactly what we did. We changed 10 out of 30,000. We diverted from, from being pigs about 80 million years ago, right? So we're very different, right? Although there's, like all mammals, we share some DNA, of course. So the 10-gene the pig is interesting. We knocked out four genes, and we placed six genes in. Okay, so the knockout genes were basically um, the kind of genes that you might say are like blood type. Okay, they were carbohydrate genes. And those were the genes um, that, um, three of those genes were, were that. Uh, were, they're the bee sting genes, if you wish, to, the, to foreignness that the body innately recognizes and causes thrombosis. And those are the alpha-gal um, group and another uh, sugar group called SEMA. To that, because pigs grow, and there was concern that these pigs would outgrow um, the human, if you wish. You know, the, the average pig's about 400 pounds, right? So the concern was that those full-term big pigs would have organs that would outgrow a small chest or an abdomen. And they thought there were some examples of that. Now, I, I'm a doubting Thomas on that. But to show you the cleverness of these folks who used CRISPR, of course, um, to, to convert these genes, they, they knocked out a growth control gene called a growth uh, hormone receptor, right? And they did that because there is a syndrome in humans called Laron syndrome. And if you're born with Laron syndrome, you don't have that homo, homo uh, what was it? Geisically. And, and so if you don't have that gene, you're, you're born small. You're born basically as a dwarf. Um, and so they basically made dwarf pigs. And they, the pigs look a little bit dwarfoid. They're, they're really kind of interesting to look at because they're, they're, they're very, very different than the wild types. But they don't grow as fast and their organs don't grow quite as big. That is probably going to cause a problem. Um, oh, let's just go back real quickly. So the, 
the six genes that get knocked in, right? Four of them have to do with coagulation, two complement regulators, and just thrombin and thrombosis regulators uh, for the other two. And then finally, the milieu after this transplant is probably pretty inflamed, and there are two regulators of inflammation as well, okay? Um, C, C, um, CD46, uh, HDAF, uh, thrombomodulin, ECPR, which regulates thrombomodulin, and then um, IAP, which is CD47, and then um, uh, hemooxygenase 1, which is uh, anti-inflammatory. The IAP is interesting. That's, that's the thing that uh, sits on a, on, a, um, on a cell and basically tells the body, don't eat me. So they put a whole lot of don't eat me's on there. It's kind of nice. Anyhow, so let's see what happens. So when you put this stuff in, uh, does it express? And this was the results of autopsy at 60 days with our first patient. And it expressed pretty well. It did what it was supposed to do. We can see the immune histochemical changes on the left. Um, e EPCR is interesting because it's on a regulator and it's induced under endothelial stress. And so you can see it was induced on 30 day uh, biopsy. And you can see a previous biopsy was negative. And then the Western over on the right uh, just shows at postmortem what's going on. So basically, the genes are working and doing what they're supposed to do. OK, what's going on here? Anybody want to venture a guess what this is all about? What am I showing you? That's an animal. It's a baboon. The head is to the right. The hind end is to the left. And the tummy is shaved. So. Um, Somebody want to want to help me with this? What what do you think is going on here? That's the heart in the tummy, right? So this is a surgical animal, and two years before this, it was implanted into the abdomen. And this was the animal that made Dr. Mohadeen believe that he had the right immune suppression, right? He was on the right track. This was the longest any uh, pig heart. It was a this was a genetically altered pig heart, not a ten gene pig heart, but it was close. Um, it was the longest uh, anybody was able to keep by, by at least twice to keep uh, a heart beating in the abdomen of a non-human primate. Well, we were interested in this, and it was really this work that got us to get him to come to Maryland. So he popped up to Maryland. We became friends and buddies, and it was my job to translate the intra-abdominal work to an intra intrathoracic work such that it would duplicate a human heart transplant. So a non-working intra-abdominal procedure now is gonna give way to a intrathoracic procedure where the patient's own heart is removed and the new heart would go. So this would be pure pre-translational, -trans if you wish, right? So uh, it took a while to get that going right, but we finally did. And um, you can see there are a few groups here and, Notice at the end, it's embarrassing. This isn't science, right? This is kind of show and tell because you can't do science when each procedure costs a half a million bucks. Oh, well, why don't you do this? Okay, that's a million, thanks. We'll do two of them. So this was all hunt and peck uh, with respect to the genetic alterations and the different lines uh, show you that. This is a, actually, the longest is a seven gene pig, which we like better for reasons I'm not gonna go into. These are the 10 gene pigs. The company wanted the 10 gene pigs because they thought it was more universal as a, as a one, one pig for all organs, right? And they thought it would work for the lung and the kidneys and maybe the liver, anyhow, and the heart. So we got the 10, 10 gene pig, get over it. Um, remember I told you that, that we had, that's, a, that's obviously a donor pig. It's not obvious to you, but it, I'm telling you it is. Um, that's a 10 gene pig, and it is back the donor of our second patient. Um, I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but that's just the way this talk is arranged to go. Um, anyhow, this, this animal, of course, I told you, had a, a knockout of the growth hormone receptor. And as such, it's a kind of dwarf in its, its uh, proportions. That 2.6 inches is the size of the blades on those, uh, on that mediastinal um, retractor. Because I was trying to get perspective. It's very hard to get perspective, but it was 2.6 inches when I first showed it, not where it is now. So it's small heart. 
Um, and one of our problems has been to try to size these hearts when they're in the barn. Once a, once a pig is identified as maybe a clinical pig, they don't like it to leave the barn. It stays in this DPF facility. So you don't get a lot of shots to play with it. And somebody had done an echo and they didn't do a, what I would consider to be the job we wanted. And so we needed better, better views. And it's very hard to get a, uh, an echo on a pig because there's so much lung, so much air that gets in the way of the echo and, and makes it difficult to see the outlines of the true heart. So they need to have one of the ones that's done through the assumption.